Well, thanks, Sean, for the introduction. Um, I'm Alexander Lex. Um, I'm from the Harvard uh, University, Harvard School of Engineering, from Professor Hans Peter Pistos Group. Uh, but the work I'm talking about today is actually done when I still was at TU Graz in Austria. Um, and it's actually a paper, uh, first author is Christian Patel, who is a PhD student um, in Graz. Um, and, and all the other people are from Graz or affiliated with Graz as well. So uh, the paper is called En Route, Dynamic Path Exploration from Biological Pathway Maps for In-Depth Experimental Data Analysis. Long title, uh, I'm going to tell you what it is all about. So what is it with experimental data and pathways? Well, pathways as they are, for example, um, presented in CAG, they, they, present, uh, they represent consensus knowledge for a healthy organism or for a specific disease. So um, it's, it's kind of like a, a generalization of what is happening and what's kind of uh, um, happening in, in a model organism. It's not really what is happening in my cell. So therefore, uh, this uh, data cannot account for the variation which you find in, real world, uh, in, in the real world. So if you're, if you're looking at your cell, the pathway might be slightly different because you have a changed uh, uh, gene expression, or because one of the genes is mutated, or because uh, you are trying to modulate what is happening in the pathway by using dr drugs. Um, so it's important to, to see experimental data in the context of pathway, and this is what our technique is about. But you could ask, why would you use visualization to do such a thing? Um, well, here I have a little task for you. Try to get a picture, uh, try to associate this table here, a very simple one experiment table, to this very trivial pathway. You will be able to do it, but it won't be too easy for you because you do need to do a serial search. But if I just do that, you immediately get the picture. You can see what the, what the depend dependencies are. Um, well, in the real life, it's not that easy um, because you have the, the, the typical pathway looks something like this. This is kind of representative. It's not too big. It's not too small. Uh, and then you have uh, experimental data, but you have lots of it. You don't have one experiment typically, but you have hundreds. You have many different conditions, and you want to be able to see this. And how people have done this in the past, to try to put it all onto one node. Um, and I would say that fails if you do more than six or seven. I would even say it fails if you do more than two, but six or seven is kind of reasonable. So you can do six or seven experiments by using on-node mapping, but you can't do more. Um, what do you have to think about if you would like to visualize experimental data in the context of pathways? Well, you have two conflicting goals. The first one is you want to preserve the topology of the graph you're looking at. So you want to be able to judge uh, what is connected, what are the uh, interdependencies between the different nodes. Uh, and at the same time, you want to be able to show a lot of heterogeneous experimental data. So you might have five or six different data sets with 500 patients each and 10 groups each. So um, that's as you can see, if you want to visualize lots of experimental data, you, you'd have to go into some kind of matrix representation. But if you want to preserve the topology, um, then uh, you have a problem if you want to do both at the same time. Um, and we're trying to cheat this um, a little bit by uh, finding a compromise between this with the Kaleido en route technique. So what is the concept of the visualization technique? So we have two views. On the left-hand side, you can see a pathway view. It's the same picture as I've shown you before. Uh, and out of this pathway, we select one path. We let the user select one path. So in this case, from A to E. And then we extract this path and put it in the en route view. And we try to preserve the topology as good as possible by just showing you where our incoming edges, where our outgoing edges. But it's, of course, not the whole topology. So if you would like to see the whole topology, you'll have to refer to the path view. But now that, now that we have a linear structure here, you're able to put a lot of experimental data next to your linearized version of the pathway. Uh, and that's what we're doing. So, and here you can also put different groups. So here is one group, here's another group, and here you can also put different data sets. So basically by, by doing this little trick, you, you certainly get uh, um, a reference, uh, some space for, for showing experimental data. So um, a brief explanation in detail of how this works. So we have the pathway view, which is basically we take CAC or wiki pathway pathways, and then we do on node mapping on for the averages. This is important because it uh, it tells you a little bit about uh, what's 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 roughly going on, but it doesn't isn't very reliable, um, and especially it's not reliable if you don't account for variance. Uh, but we try to account for variance by also plotting the standard deviation of the experiment. So basically, what this tells you if you have a low bar here. Um, then you can trust the values. But if you have a high bar here, then you should really look deeper into your data. 
And then we let the user select the path. And we highlight this with a technique which is called bubble sets. Um, and um, you can, these bubble sets, you can select them by either clicking your start node and then end node or by iteratively adding nodes. And this way you can also do cycles. Um, so, and we try to, if you click a start node and an end node, we compute the shortest path, but we also compute all the alternatives. And you can switch between these uh, like that and you immediately get the, uh, the extracted version. So the in-root, now let's talk a little bit about how we represent the experimental data in the on-root view. Um, well, first, um, here's the, the extracted path again. And as I told you, we try to preserve the topology and we, and we indicate uh, what we have here in, 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 the, in these abstract branch nodes on the sites. Um, and out of these abstract branch nodes, we can, um, we can expand them and then we can see the actual branches. So for example, in this case, I have two branches going out of this IGF-1 gene um, and going down to this one. And now I would be interested, for example, uh, by, uh, for switching in, uh, into my path representation uh, this, this gene here. And I would simply click this and then we would modify the path uh, and you would see um, the path and uh, a continuation of the path as long as it's unique. Um, and um, now let's talk a little bit about how we encode the experimental data. Well, gene expression data is numerical in most cases. So you would have, um, we, we chose to use bar charts instead of heat maps uh, simply because bar charts are better than heat maps. But of course, you have to have the space for using bar charts. And in this case, we do have the space. Um, and we distinguish between showing everything, showing every single experiment, or showing an abstraction of a group, so showing an average. So this would be the same data set shown once uh, every single experiment. And here we have an, uh, an bar which just encodes the average plus the standard deviation. So for copy number data, you can think of copy number data as ordered categorical data. Um, and here we, have, we came up with this little um, visual encoding where you have a, a baseline, which means if you, have, if, you're, if you have nothing here, that means the corresponding patient at this position doesn't have a change in copy number. But if you have bars pointing upwards, he's an increased copy number. If you have bars pointing downwards, he is deletion in at least one of the alleles. Um, and as an abstract representation to show a larger group, uh, we use histograms because they're very efficient of, of uh, summarizing lots of data. And for mutation data, we decided to go for a binary representation because we are, uh, at this point, we are only looking at is a gene mutated or not. Uh, and this is very space efficient. And for, as an abstract version, we again use a histogram. And this is how the root view looks uh, all together. Um, so you can see the path I talked about. You can see the abstract bars here. You can see the individual bars. And then here we have copy number data. And here we have uh, mutation data. And what you're seeing here is data from uh, glioblastoma multiform, data set from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, and you have four different subtypes. So here is uh, proneural, neural, classical, mesenchymal subtypes of this cancer. OK, if I have a minute, I, one minute, I will give a very brief live demo, which is the end of my talk. OK, so here, um, well, the resolution isn't too good. But here we have the pathway, and I can simply click the resolution is bad. Um, well, I can click uh, individual items, and you can see how uh, the path is update, updated. And I can go over the other parts. Uh, and now I'll give you a 40-second introduction into this view. So basically, everything here is linked. And you could, for example, select here the increased copy number variation for this gene. And then you would see that this corresponds also to high expression uh, for this pro subtype. And you can also see that the high copy number variation uh, mainly occurs in the proneural subtype here. So this is the 30-second uh, Kaleido on root introduction. Uh, thank you for your time, um, and um, I'm open for questions.